Hey everybody, it's the Board Game Blogger. That's right, I got a little Board Game Blogette on the way. Uh, very excited about that, but uh, I'm sure the reason you're turning in is to see what game I'm uh, reviewing today. Today it's Gonzaga. It's a really fun uh, game. I don't think there's any other game that's quite like it. Um, the theme is, you know, you're one of the uh, dynastic families from the Renaissance era and you're trying to gain as much control uh, of key cities and key uh, trade ports in Europe. Um, there's also additional ways uh, to score points by uh, gaining control of Europe and it's it's a really neat game there's some some neat mechanics and there's almost uh, a puzzle like feature in uh, in creating Empire, because what you do is you have different pieces that are sort of prefabricated uh, and you're placing them on the board to try and control the various cities and ports. It's just, it's a really neat game. Uh, the rule book is pretty good. Uh, it's nice in color. It's pretty simple rules, uh, easy to understand. Uh, one of the the problems I do have with the game is there is a, a player aid, but there's just one card. This game plays two to four. Uh, it really plays well with all of them because uh, you don't play the whole map. You basically close down areas of the map depending on how many you're playing. Uh, additionally, there's lots of different scenarios on which areas of the map are closed. So, you know, I think there's a lot of replayability. It's not that you're playing the same. Oh, you know, in a two-player game, you always close down Britain and Italy. No, no, it's it's different each time. Uh, you just kind of randomly draw which scenario you have, and so that's neat. I think it adds a lot of replayability to the game. Uh, but it, it's just it's a very unique game, and you can definitely be cut off in placements. And so some people uh, I play with, you know, they just like to make their plan and they like the multiplayer solitaire and they don't like being cut off, that's not this game. This game, uh, there's a lot of player interaction, you can definitely have your plans foiled. Uh, which I like, I, I love it. This, to me, this is a wonderful game. Uh, you know, you've got the, the great gaming elements, plus this almost puzzle-like uh, feature in that you're trying to place your your empire uh, to fit uh, the correct hexagons. And it's just, it's a great game, but why don't we see how it actually plays. So here's the board on setup. Uh, we're playing the Mozart scenario, which just has France, Germany, and Italy available. You can see here, Germany is active, and this would mean it's inactive. Now you can still build in inactive areas, however the victory points aren't worth anywhere near as much. Um, but everyone being in the game, they're randomly assigned uh, some secret objectives to get, and some of those will be in inactive regions. So that's a reason you'll want to build there. And, uh, you know, if you get these cities, you're scoring some pretty big bonus points, and it uh, definitely escalates. So at one, it's you're just getting a bonus point of two, but if you get all six, you're getting a 35 bonus points. So that's sort of a hidden objective. Now, um, in a four-player game, it's much harder to complete all of your hidden objectives as they might overlap with other people or you're being blocked. Um, it's a little easier to do in a two-player game, but two-player game is still uh, quite good. Now, at the beginning of the turn for each player, what you're going to do is flip over uh, your card and you see which place you have which piece you have active so here this is uh, this four piece now there's two castles on it now this is important because you can't place a castle in the water I couldn't just place it like that as this leaves the castle in a water square it's got to end um, in a non-water square um, now, for each city that I place this on, I'm going to score uh, three points. And for each harbor, I'm going to score three points. Now, we know I've got some hidden objectives 
for cities to get, which will net me much more. And if we zoom in here, we also see that there's sort of unique symbols. Uh, that's an easy way to tell which cities you're going for. Also, for these harbor markers, it's important because there's going to be four harbor markers of each symbol. If you can uh, have your empire on all in three or four of a particular harbor symbol, you've formed a trade league, which scores you an additional 10 points. Um, finally, there's an end game bonus of 15 points for the person who has the most connected pieces. So that's not the most connected hexes, but the most connected pieces together. Um, so now I know I'm going to be placing this piece and the uh, other a player is going to be placing that piece. Now what's key about that is also the numbers. So the yellow player drew an 84, whereas I drew just a 22. And that means that on priority, uh, I'm going to be able to place for, first. And priority is very important. So next, I'm going to decide where I want to place it. And I'll be combining some cards to do so. First, I will decide in which region I want to place. So I can do Italy, Germany, France, or just one general card for inactive regions. Now this is really important because when I select this card, at least one uh, hex has to be placed in the card I select. And also for the following turn, I will not have access to this card. So you have to have some foresight in where you're placing. Um, additionally, let's say, you know, I only had one spot in Germany where I was going to place this and I've secretly put down the German card for my placement and the, my opponent places first and blocks me out. You know, it can definitely uh, affect that. So I first select, you know, where I'm going. I'm going to be placing this on my player aid marker, which would look sort of, you know, just like this. The other ones I'm not using are here. And then on the turn after, they're going to slide here and I won't have access to them. Um, you've got these rings here as well, which I'll explain in a second. But it's just, you need some definite planning when you're making a decision where to place. So I'm going to pick Germany. And then I'm going to also decide how I want to place my card. Uh, and I can build in one of four ways. Uh, there's the first one which is the king which simply just gives you top priority. It costs a ring and then you will also from your deck down you're going to your actual action is going to be the top one that you've stacked. So the king really just gets you priority if you want to play you know a C or a B or an A card and have ensure top priority. If there's a spot you absolutely need to place and you're afraid your opponent might go there first, that's why you'd want to use the king. Now the other three cards, you have A, B, or C. Now A will always have priority over a B and C. So let's say I have played an A card and my opponent's placed a B card. Well then I will get to place my uh, Empire card first. Um, it, whereas if we're both tied, if we both place down a B card, then it who is whoever has the lower number on the piece they're placing. Uh, so an A card means I can connect either one or two harbors. I cannot connect a city if I play this card. So if I did, you know, A in Germany, I could place like this. This would be a valid legal move as I'm connecting this one harbor. However, if I placed it down here, that would be an illegal move as I'm connecting a city. Or if I place it here, this would also be an illegal move as I haven't connected a harbor. But So let's say I have placed it here. Well, then I cannot place just on one or two harbors on the next turn. So it's, it's very strategic in what you're planning next. So it's definitely a planning game, but it's a planning game where your opponent can block you and knock you out. And I absolutely love that. I think this... This game is just fantastic, but I know some people, they like doing their planning games and they just like to do their own thing. 
If, if you like multiplayer solitaire, this is not the game for you. You're definitely going to get uh, your, your plans, you know, ruined by other players. So that's how the A card works. We now have the B card, which lets you place in just empty space in one, two, or three cities. So this would be a legal move, or this would be a legal move. Again, if I'd placed it here, um, while it's legal on a B, it would be illegal if I'd also placed down the Germany card, as this isn't anywhere in Germany. Whereas this would be legal, as I'm in both Germany and France, as long as I have one space in Germany. That's fine. And then I have the C card, which lets me do either a city and a harbor, two cities and one harbor, or two harbors and one city. And that's the only card you can play to enable you to build on both harbors and cities on that same turn. Additionally, you have these rings, and you can place either one or two rings. So as you could see earlier, you got the stockpile of rings. They can be used as the king, or they can be used to just simply place down on the map. Now this is important because what it lets you do is if your opponent has already knocked you out here, and let's say this is on my secret hidden objective, I need to get this city, I can then do a dynastic marriage and place a ring there. Now I place this in lieu of placing this piece. So I don't use this piece and it's gone for the game. Now if I place one ring, I can additionally choose to place a second ring, but it has to be adjacent to the first ring placed. Um, additionally, these rings count as pieces, as just a whole piece towards your goal of getting 15 points. And that's the game, is you are selecting what move you're doing. So I'm going to do A and Germany, and my opposing player is going to do B in Germany. So now we both flip over simultaneously. We check who has priority. Uh, the blue player does with the A. And they will place their piece here. And now the B player will go. Uh, the yellow player. And they're going there, as this might have been one of their hidden goals. And that's the turn. We now flip over everyone finds out what they're placing next, and gets out the piece. Again, this is public knowledge, so you know, this is more important later on in the game, you know what piece they have capable of placing, and you know where it's going to fit on the map. And slowly this map is being covered, and once somebody else's piece is down there, you're really blocked and locked out of that, that space, unless you're using dynastic marriages. Um, finally, if you don't want to place your piece at all, let's say, you know, I had selected A and did the harbor, and this is later on in the game, and all the German harbors are covered because the, my opponent just went first, they used the king. Well, then I can choose to donate this piece just to the church, just for three points. So you're never completely locked out of an action. You can always donate your piece to the church if you don't have a, a better action to do. But that's the game. The board is beautiful. The pieces are wonderful. Um, it's just a really neat and innovative game. Um, with, you know, you're placing your castles and you're growing, you know, your, your royal family. You can do it through dynastic marriage or through simple expansion. It's a great use of the theme. And the, the pieces are wonderful. It's kind of almost like Tetris because you're trying to put down the pieces to fit, to score the points. You can definitely be blocked by your opponents. Um, you know, there's great negotiation where you're like trying to convince your other other players to, to block someone's opponent from getting the most connected and it's just it's a wonderful game it's definitely not for everyone if you uh, if you don't want your plans interfered with this isn't that game uh, but if you like player interaction and you like theme uh, this is a great game highly recommend it anyway till next time on the board game blogger